recognised. He has a known commodity in the Pokemon world, and that that's kind of cool. That it's somebody who's is quite a quite a recognisable face, bringing a deck that everybody thought, nah, its time is over, and Brad's going, hang on a second, maybe not. And I love it that it's Brad bringing it to the table because he was one of the ones that was really advocating it, pushing it from the get-go right out the gates. He made top four, or should be top eight at Seattle Regionals with Drampagarb in the first place, and he considered con consistently uh, used it in subsequent tournaments and everything afterwards, and consistently made top 32 with it as well. So somebody who really knows the deck in and out, bringing it back from that little resurrection, so to speak, since we haven't seen it in a little while. And uh, and then the best part is he's going to be playing against Zachary Bakari. So Zachary. Bakari just came off a world's win in seniors division, and this is his first year in Masters, and let me tell you, he's had a pretty good run so far. I was going to say, it's a name that sounds familiar, and if you guys do find that name familiar, yeah, one world's in seniors, and we've seen this time and time again. There's, you know, there's some players out there who go, oh, well, you know, seniors division, it's not Masters, is it? Well, here's the thing, the good seniors pretty much always become good masters. You see this year after year, the really top level senior players, they come into masters and they just don't miss a beat. Speaking of not missing a beat, let's not miss a beat of this game. Zachary seems to be going first. He starts with a Zorua. Ooh, but he just benches a Magnemite and seems to pass without doing very much at all. Now, what's interesting is I also did see the Magnezone already in his hand. I don't know if he has a rare candy or any way to search it out, but definitely, you know, if he's holding that rare candy Magnezone on turn two, I mean, the moment that that card comes out, Magnezone is a uh, Pokemon to stage two with an ability called Dual Brains. When Dual Brains is active, it allows that player to play two supporters in a turn. So it really opens up all kinds of possibilities that you never would have been able to be, uh, be able to accomplish otherwise. Speaking Always. Of, so, sorry, speaking of opening up possibilities, we've got the video game people shouting on the other side of the room. They're excited. I'm excited. Big Wheel GX. Turn one GX attack. You do not see that very often. Shuffling your hand into your deck, getting a new hand of 10 cards. So in the same way Zachary's trying to open up possibilities with that Magnezone, Brad is trying to open up possibilities with that Big Wheel GX. And, and we see this sometimes. When a player doesn't do anything turn one is it because they had a great hand or was it because they had a terrible hand right he's got the zoroark we've got a second zero as well he plays uh he uses trade to actually get the ranger in the discard pile and we did also see brad create a parallel city on his first turn one of his three copies that he has in his deck did so he just top deck a rare candy i believe that is that either no, a rare candy a versus or a, seeker i think it's a versus seeker and a puzzle of time oh, so he's still sad. still not quite able to get that magnezone out um he does not play any copies of magneton so he is going to have to use the rare candy if he wants to put that into play he yeah, absolutely is. Speaking of what he's playing, his 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 uh, poker excuse me, his energy list for double colorless energy. Now Drampa's Riotous Edge is so good, of you know, it's so good against a deck that only plays double colorless energy. So you know Zachary is going to have to think extremely carefully, and he's only going to attach that double colorless energy when he's got a KO on the board. If he doesn't have the KO guaranteed, that double colorless is staying in his hand. And he's just not playing it because that Drampa's Righteous Edge, it's going to be awkward because he's got Righteous Edge and Riotous Beating. Going to have to get those the right way around. <laughs> he's, it's so dangerous for decks that rely on double colorless energy. Now, Brad didn't have a great turn himself. The one good thing about Brad's turn was that Big Wheel GX. He's got that uh, hand of 10 cards now. And you know he's thinking, right, now I need my Trubbish. Now I need my energy. Now I need to get rolling. Is he playing any Team Magma Secret base here? No, he is not playing any Team Magma Secret base. His only actually uh, activator for Berserk is his one single copy of Rainbow Energy. So not something that you're really going to expect to see uh, come out soon to play too often. Uh, but I know Brad, and he's always the kind of person he's been playing Trampa for a while. He really knows how to make the most out of Berserk to make sure to put your opponent into situations where they need to damage that Trampa, or excuse me, damage something in order to... Uh, and puts you in the position where you get to use Berserk. Now, he does put the Tauros on the board, but because he used Big Wheel, it's going to be a little bit less of a threat. The Tauros isn't going to be able to be, have that Mad Bull waiting to be able to punish, um, but he is going to still be able to take out either the Magnemite or the Zura, decides to go with it because he's got the double colorless, right. 60 damage right off the pot, and he's about to put himself in a position where when this Tauros takes damage, because it's very unlikely for Bakari to be able to pull off all the cards he needs for a one-shot, not only is he going to activate normal rage, which still is a thing on Tauros, but also set up that Berserk, like I was saying. 
Yeah, which is going to be absolutely brilliant. I mean, I love the fact here. Horn Attack does 60 damage for a double colorless energy. It's not great. But when you can combine it with a Guzma, and there is a Magnemite on the bench who just so happens to have 60 HP, it becomes great. And it's like you said, you know, sitting there poking for 60 damage a turn, it's not great. But in the context of, if you don't KO me, I can either hit you back harder with Rage, or I can then go into my Dramper and I'm then activating Berserk for 150 rather than 80. Now all of a sudden, it's like, look, if you hit me, brilliant. If you don't, I'm going to do 60 damage a turn. So have fun. There is no right play here, unless you can hit something like a Guzma to start hitting my Pokemon on the bench. And I think you're right that, you know, that, that Tauros there, it wasn't just that it got the KO on the Magnemite, though that was awesome. It was the fact that 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 KO, while leaving the Tauros active, is just brilliant. Absolutely. Now, we do see the Parallel City coming off the board, so it's the first one down for Brad. Uh, both players playing a cop uh, three copies of Stadiums, so that does give Bakari the advantage, being the first one to knock it out. Uh, knock out the Stadium, excuse me. And with Brad on the bench, he does have the Trubbish there. And I got we got to talk about Garbotaxi for a moment, because something interesting about Bakari's list is he actually plays no copies of Field Blower, no copies of Zerosic, and only one copy of Guzma. So this is only out. If that Garboda comes out and gets a tool attached, then Zachary's going to actually have to play the Guzma to bring it active. But if you don't have the trade on the Zoroark, if you don't have the Jewel Brains on the Magnazone, and you see those Execute on the bench. Execute's brilliant. The Propagation ability, put it from your discard pile into your hand. So if you lose those bench Pokemon, you get them back super easily. Problem with that, can't propagate if your opponent's got a Garboda out. And we do see one of them coming down with uh, Parallel City number two hitting for Brad. Um, and he's even going to be able to Super Odd back into a couple cards. So he did get to discard her uh, Garbo Toxin on the early plays. Now it goes right back into the deck, makes it a little bit easier to find. Um, I actually believe it's two Garbo Toxin and two of the... Trasher Lunch. Yeah, we saw that. There was a 2-2 two -two split, which is quite popular with these Garbo decks. I mean, the one thing that I'm looking at if I'm Zachary at the moment, there's no Magnemite on the bench and the Parallel City's down. So it's not just that he doesn't have a Magnazone. We know for a fact that there's not going to be a Magnazone next turn. Garboda is probably going to come down next turn if Brad can get some decent draws. And I love that second Trubbish there just to make sure. So when you combine these, it really is just... You know, you don't have your Magnazone. I've got the Parallel City. I've got the Ability Lock up. And like I say, hitting 60... That, actually, 90 damage because of the whole, you know choice band thing <laughs> it's just it's great it's really good Taurus is a card that saw a lot of play early completely dropped off and now there's people looking and going oh oh yeah I forgot this was a thing. It was the first, well, excuse me, actually, it wasn't the first GX attack we had. We had uh, the Snorlax GX promo that came out before it, but it was the first real GX attack that we had that saw a lot of play. Um, really interesting to see it coming back as a counter for things like Trevenant, Night March, uh, Seismitoad. There's a lot of cards that really, Toros likes to just put them in check, you know, and put your opponent into awkward situations. And like we were saying, play, you know, it has such synergy with Drampa, Overall, a really interesting but great inclusion that we're going to be seeing in, Drampa, in the Drampagarp list here for Brad Curcio. Yeah, I mean, we see Zachary here. He's playing a, um, an Ultra Ball. Gets rid of all oh, that's a painful discard. Gets rid of an Execute. Also gets rid of a Rare Candy. He's only playing two of them. One Silver Lining. He is playing four Puzzle of Time. And a lot of decks are playing four Puzzle of Time this weekend. That does mean that now he can either search it out from his deck or he can search it out from his discard using Puzzle of Time. So it's not the worst thing ever. It's not a, it's not a terrible position for him here. But he is in a position, Zachary, where it's a case of... Well, I don't have a Magnemite. Now there's only one rare candy in my deck, assuming it's not prized. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can double Puzzle of Time it back. It's, it's one of those games where Brad's not doing all that much, but he's just putting Zachary in a position where it's, you know what? He's just slowing him down enough that he doesn't have that many options, and that's going to hurt in the long run. Absolutely, and right now he's putting him in another position, you know, having that choice band and everything there as well. Um, He's really being able to set up that Zorark, so if the Zorark gets into the Tauros, he should be able to return the knockout without any issues whatsoever. And that's going to be a problem. I mean, even that, just like the 60 little damage poke, well, now it puts Zorark from 210 down to 150. So now if you hit for 150 with Riotous Beating, well, then in comes Rage for 140, 170 with a choice ban. You see where this is adding up here. It's not going to be the most difficult thing ever for Brad to get the return KO with that Tauros. 
And that's what he's looking for. That's going to be quite big. That is the danger of coming up against the Tauros. Because it's not even like I can two-hit KO it. Most Pokemon, if you can't get the one-hit KO, you sigh and you two-hit KO. That's not an option you have with Tauros. Tauros is brilliant. Even if you can't use Mad Bull and you know Brad is a little bit sad that he couldn't use... That he had to use Big Wheel GX on oh, turn yeah. one. But he's still got Rage. Rage is still a decent attack. And as it is... You know, Brad's up by a prize. That Taurus has taken a prize. It's put 90 on the Zorak, even if it goes down this turn. It's put a shift in. Oh, yeah. It's definitely... You can definitely say it's, hold, it's held its own weight by now. It's... By far, it's gone, gone wonders for him. Um, seeing that Mal coming down for Zet Makari, though, again, allowing him to be able to trade right into the cards that he wants. Super effective tool that we're seeing a lot of the Zorak players start utilizing, especially when you're combining it with things like Magnezone, where I can play his order right afterwards. Um... And as well, something else that you really have to remember here is a lot of the matches, you got to remember about uh, Trash Lance. You, yes. oh, as, as the game starts ticking, if you're not paying attention, you can just start having items tick up, items tick up. We've only got two in the discard pile right now, but it doesn't really take long when you're trading cards every turn to be able to get to that number where you're at 10 items doing 200 damage, yeah. you know? And that, that, that's a great point. One thing I will say, and this is why that, that Garbola is such a downside for Zachary here, that propagation ability on the execute, it means you can just take a card into your hand. It means that trade just draws you two cards. Great in theory, but as soon as that Garbola comes down, you can't trade, you can't propagate. And, oh, this is a, that's a great play from Brad. He drops the Parallel City. Zachary gets rid of the Execute, doesn't care, that's not important. But he has to get rid of the Sudo Woodoo, which means Brad now gets five bench spots, not four. He's got the Garboda. If he's got a tool as well, then Garboda's Garbotoxin comes on and things are going to start going downhill for Zachary very quickly indeed. Oh, yeah, and he's got plenty of tools out there. He plays four copies of Floatstone, and, of course, he has his Choice Bands that he's going to have in there as well, four of them also. So he has eight different tools that he can put on. On that garble toxin um so he's definitely got a lot of different outs to be able to kind of put him into that position now that was brad's last parallel city but he does play dowsing machine as his a spec so even though bakari does have another sky field to be able to put into play brad actually could knock out the final sky field of him and then it comes into things like puzzle of time and this that and the other which is really kind of interesting though overall to see puzzle of time come to that pack it, you're almost at a disadvantage not playing Puzzle of Time in this format. And I am surprised quite how many Puzzle of Time we're seeing this weekend. It's one of those cards which really is seeing more and more play. And it's kind of crept up on it. It's, it's always been there in the expanded format, but it's it's gone from a few decks playing it to many, and here comes the Floatstone. Brad plays an end, hits the Floatstone, in comes that Garbo Toxin, and now Zachary is in that position we talked about before. Either he hits his single copy of Guzma and knocks it out, or he has no abilities, no propagation, no trade, no dual brains. It's going to be more difficult to get that the zone out, and if he does get it out, it's not going to do very much. Nothing at all, actually. So, I mean, it's going to almost be this vanilla matchup where Zachary's going to be having to try to set up these Zorks and use Riotous Beating to just try to keep up without really using abilities, which, sure, he plays maybe a couple more supporters than your average Zorark deck just because he's playing Magnezone, but it's really still not going to be that much that he has to go off of. He's still going to have to get really lucky off some of his draws. He does have the three copies of Colrus, but... There's a parallel city on one side, and Brad's also limiting his bench on his side, so Colrus isn't even drawing the usual 8 to 10 cards that you'd like to be seeing with a deck like this. Oh, and you're right, he plays the Colrus. He had it in his hand, he had to play. He's only getting 6 cards. Now, if he ends up drawing into Rare Candy, Magnazone, Guzma, that could be cool. Having said that, He's in this awkward position where he could, in theory, get the KO on the Tauros here. Oh, we do see the Guzma, and we see an Ultra Ball, so he was only one card short from that combination. But, oh, that unfortunately, not quite enough. Well, he wouldn't actually get the KO now anyway. Firstly, there's no double colorless right. energy. Secondly, he's only actually hitting for 80 with the Parallel City, which is a great tech against Zoroark. But maybe if he's able to grab himself, and it's not just the fact that he can't get rid of the tool, Field Blower would get rid of that Parallel City as well, which would be huge right now. Yep. I mean, Field Blower or Zero Seek, either one of those would be a card I would love to see Zachary have in his ar arsenal right now, but it's not an option, so he's going to have to play with the resources that he does. Um, he does even have cards, though, kind of what, he has copies of Delinquent, um, he has copies of Carrot, he has Hex Maniacs, he has all kinds of these niche supporters, but no Zero Seek. But... Maybe he could catch Brad, Brad off guard with a delinquent in one game. You know, it is one way that he can pop off this, this parallel city. So, you know, there could be some decent plays coming out of that pretty soon.
That absolutely could. Now we see Brad here playing a Professor Juniper. No, sorry, it's a Professor Sycamore. <laughs> Weird, it's fun, fun thing I love about Expanded. Both those cards are legal. They both do the same thing. But a rule was very quickly put in place. You can only play one or the other. You have to choose. He gets a new hand of seven. But Brad here, it's more of a ticking along kind of turn. Brad has got the Garboda. So getting a choice band for his Drampa, good. Maybe getting a second Garboda out would be nice. But it's kind of... All he's doing is, he's, he's supposed like he's topping up his setup. He doesn't need anything here. He gets the KO with the Tauros, goes down to three prizes. What Brad is doing here, he's just getting his setup a little bit better than it was before. Zachary is the one that's under pressure here. He's down three prizes. He doesn't have a Magnazone. He doesn't have any energy. He's limited to three bench Pokemon. It's not looking great for him. No, it's definitely <laughs> not. You know, and Brad, like you said, even though he doesn't have access to something like trade to improve his consistency, the majority of his attackers are all basics, so if he draws a, a Bridget and some energy, your deck's pretty much set up. So it, it feels on that, since you have to use Garbotoxin to slow your opponent down, and you don't get access to those things like trade. But I mean, he's already got three of his double colorless energies in play, he does have that second Trubbish, really not much more that he can really ask for. You know, oh, And that's one of the great things about these Garboda decks, it's like if you play Vileplume, you make sure that you're less hurt by item lock. Same thing with Brad here in his Garboda deck. If you're going to play a deck that locks abilities, you know you're slowing the game down. You know you don't have that trade and the Magnazone and all of that. So you build a deck which is one or two energy, like you say, on basic Pokemon, but your opponent has not built their deck like that. You don't care that abilities are turned off, but your opponent really, really does. And... You see, Brad's not had these explosive turns. He's not taking giant KOs. He's KO'd a Magnemite and two-hit KO'd a Zoroark. Absolutely. Your <laughs> Ampagarb, it wasn't even a two-hit KO. It was a three-hit KO on the Zoroark. I mean, it's incredible oh, correct, how it slow of a process he is. But he just, like you said, he just ticks along. It's one energy per turn, just like the Zoroark decks, but he doesn't have access to these crazy ability luck trades. On paper, Trampa Garb looks so much more underwhelming than some of these other cards like Zorark and Magnezone and everything, but because of its simplicity and its consistency at what it's able to do, and then that inevit inevitability factor that comes in with Trash Lance as well, the combination of everything just makes it for just a solid all-around deck that clearly we see coming right back again. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just such, it's like a free, free part deck. You've got the Garboda, which blocks abilities. In the early game, you've got a combination of Tauros and Drampa, and that's really where Brad is here. He's in the early game. We've got that combination of the two where you're just sitting there and you're using Drampa and you're using Tauros to get some damage on the field and play around. And then when you transition to the late game, in comes the other Garboda from Guardians Rising using Trash Alange to take the last two big KOs. And I love this. He's actually using oh, Berserk yeah. for 180 with a Guzma on the Tapu Lele. He's going down to one prize. And you've got to think at this stage, Brad has basically got this game locked up. Absolutely. Even if uh, Zachary were to evolve that Magnemite into the Magnezone, it's only got 140 hit points. So so it doesn't even need a choice ban from Ladrampa, not that it would work. So at any point, a Guzman, that Magnemite, Magazone, whatever it might be, will seal it up for him. And even if he doesn't ever get the Guzma, he's got enough energy on the board that he could just go, hit Zorark, hit Zorark, hit Zorark, and eventually he's going to get his last prize. And of course, let's not forget that you do discard the special energy. You discard that double colorless when you attack with Drampa, which is a big, big thing. That righteous, that righteous edge, there we go, did it again, <laughs> does get rid of the energy, which is really crucial. And you're right, Zachary, he ends him down to one card. He ends Brad down to one. That's big. That's exactly what he needed to do. But you still look at it. And if you're Brad, you're thinking, all right, I know I'm not going to play a Tapu Lele or a Shaman. I'm ability locking and I don't have a draw engine. But what I do have is a Drampa with three energy and a choice band, a Drampa with one energy and a choice band, a Tauros with a double colorless energy and a choice band. And I have a Garboda and I have a Truffish on the bench. What do I need? <laughs> Realistically, at this point, in, in Brad's mind, he doesn't know that Zachary's not playing Field Blower, Zerosic, or second copy of Guzma. So he, the only thing he wants is he wants to make sure that he's playing around those cards because he's expecting them to come down at any moment. He's ready for Zach at any moment to go Field Blower, Rare Candy Magnezone, and just start popping off and trying to take re-control of this game. But... What we know here is that it's just not going to happen like that. So he really has to just kind of go with this ticking, go with this chip, 
You know, he's going to be able to set up the, uh, he puts his arc over at to 180, and and that's it. There, he's conceded. He's conceded. Game. <laughs> and I don't think that's a bad thing. Congratulations to Brad. Brad takes game one. It's a best of three. It's not over yet. But, I mean, we talk, I talked about this with John in the previous game. There comes a point where you have to go, you know what? I'm not winning this game. I'm going to concede this game. I'm going to save time. Now, in the previous game, we actually saw Xander go, I think I can win this. And he, he came pretty gosh darn close. So it was worth it. But Brad is going to win this game. This wasn't like the previous game where it's not taking mm -hmm. prizes. Brad is going to win that game. It's definitely going to happen. So we end up in a position instead where Zachary goes, fine. I'll leave it. It's not worth it. I want time for games two and three. And he plays an explosive deck. You can take quick KOs with, you know, with Skyfield. You can be hitting two ten a turn. Zachary can win this game in three turns. Yeah. And and right, well, four turns time you get set up. <laughs> so it's worth conceding and going, I can still win two games. 7-0-2 gets you into the dance. It gets you into that day two. So would 6-0-3. But you really want to go 702. That's the best, the easiest, the simplest way in. And yep. what Zachary's thinking here is, I want that win. I don't want a tie. A tie, a tie doesn't help me as much as I want it to. Let's go for the win. Let's concede. And I like it. As weird as that sounds. No, I agree with you. You have to think about these kind of things when you're talking about such a large tournament experience. You don't, you know, you've got to go beyond just what's happening on the field. You have to think about, all right, how do I want my match points to align to be able to get me to the record I need to be in that top 32 position? Now, and Zachary Scheib, like you said, he does have the abilities to take quick knockouts, set up fast, and I think that's exactly what he needs to do. Knowing that he doesn't play any copies of Fuel Blow or anything like that, I think that's really the main shot he has at winning, is just getting turn two, you want to see at least two Zorark GXs in play, you want to see Magnezone by turn two or three, and you want to be putting a lot of pressure on Brad, and you need to be able to have the DCs to follow up, because you're going to see righteous, a combination of Righteous Edge, Parallel City, and Garbotoxin, three things that are really good against the Zorark deck, all coming into play to try to slow down that process to get to that Garbodor lock position all over again. Yeah, absolutely. And the one thing Zachary gets going first Guaranteed one turn without ability lock, which is really, really nice. It means you can evolve before your opponent. Now, we do see an execute start from Zachary. Not ideal, but not the end of the world. You can work around that. It's not about the active. It's about what you get into play. And, yeah, you need Tapu Lele for a Bridget. You need a couple of Zorua. You need your Magnemite. When Brad goes first, he can get a Trubbish. You get a turn. And then there's a Garboda out, potentially, before you can trade. Right. If you go first, that cannot happen. Right. You will always at least get a chance to do one trade as long as you be able to, you know, get those Zoroks out on the second turn. Now, I would love to see Zach, or, you know, from Zach's side, I think he would really like to be able to see the Execute moving out of the active position this turn. So if Brad does come down with another turn one Parallel City, he can hopefully just bump it right off. Um, so, uh, overall, you know, probably going to see a Bridget still flicking through. Could be even Price, but I know I saw Magnezone over in Bakari's hand. I saw another Tapu Lele, so couple different things he could be going here. I do believe he plays a second copy of Bridget, so it would be really unfortunate when you prize both of them in these situations. I mean, I've been there. I was playing a game the other day, and I had both my Bridget prized, and I'm like, seriously, this is why I play too. Now, I love <laughs> this play, and what I like here is I don't foresee Zachary benching another Pokemon unless it's like an execute. Because if Brad does play a Parallel City, Zachary just goes, fine, I'll discard the Tapu Lele. The free po he wants, and you said it yourself, and I love it, you need two Zoroark, Magnezone. It's a lot to ask, but that is your ideal turn two. Yep. He set himself up beautifully here to accomplish that. The real question is, what's he going to have next turn? If he has a slow turn two and doesn't get the Zoroark, he ain't, he's not going to do it. But if he does do it, he's going to have a chance. Because if he can Sycamore and then Guzma, well, now he can take down that Garboda without needing. And that's why he doesn't play any Field Blower. He thinks he can get the Guzma out without having to worry about it. Problem is... You've got to get set up in order for that to work. Absolutely. And if Brad didn't prize it, he's probably going to go for his Bridget this game, which is going to be a little bit different than his first start. Just the big thing that's going to be here is he'll be able to get that guaranteed double Trubbus if he does have the Bridget, so that way he doesn't have to worry. It looks like we got some exciting happenings over there, but he won't have to worry if he gets a double Trubbus about that Sycamore, Guzma, crazy play that he can actually pull off. Uh, Zach's hand is a pretty live hand going forward. You know, I saw two different Ultra Balls. He has another Execute in his hand to try to be able to make use 
use of playing both thoughts or balls. He has a Magnazone in his hand, so if he finds a rare candy, that's going to be able to put him into a much better shape. He's got a Colrus, another top of Lele, so Zachary's got a lot of ammunition in his hand that he's able to use to try to set up and make that this turn a capitalizing turn for him. Yeah, and if he can do it, it's going to be amazing. I mean, all he needs... I mean, if he's got a Tapu Lele and an Ultra Ball, then he's sorted. He can just Ultra Ball for the Zoroark, play the Tapu Lele for the Mallow, assuming it's not prize. He can then guarantee he gets the Rare Candy Magnazone, then he can trade to draw into them from the Mallow. So if he has got Rare Candy, if he's got Ultra Ball Tapu Lele in his hand, assuming nothing's prized, he's got the combo he's going to need to get that turn two Magnazone, and that really is going to change the game around. Absolutely, and what's crazy about it is after playing that Mallow, he then gets to play a Sycamore. And I believe he actually just <laughs> top decked the Mallow, so he doesn't even have to play the top of Lele here. He, totally he gets to just, just Yeah, he gets to just play the Mallow right from hand, grab the rare candy, put the Zork into play. He has Delinquent here if he wants to. He's actually got a lot of different options. I'm really interested to see where he actually ends up taking this turn. This is interesting. Now, also interesting, Brad again had to use the turn one big wheel GX. And that, that's rubbish, because it means you don't get Mad Bull GX. Is it but rubbish it... or trubbish? <laughs> oh, I'll answer on that one. <laughs> but what it does mean is he's got a new hand of 10 cards, and we saw how the Big Wheel GX helped him in the last game. So even though you don't get your Mad Bull GX, which is sad, you, end, you start your second turn going, like, look how many cards I have. Look at all of my options. And that in and of itself is great. So there goes the Ultra Ball. Yeah, and there goes the Mallow, so all he's going to do here... Now, did he Ultra Ball for the Zoroark? I believe yes, he did. he did. So it's just going to be Rare Candy Magnazone on the top of his deck, and then he can just trade a card from his hand, draw into them, and then, like you say, he's got another supporter. Yep. So maybe... Now, we would need a... God, has he got five Pokemon? No, he's, he's got, got a Skyfield in his hand. He's got a Lele in his hand. He's got the Magnazone already. So all he needs to guarantee is the, the rare candy off the top. And then he gets to choose another card. Probably looks like he's eyeing and what I'm hoping for is an end. Because yeah. you don't really want to give your opponent a ten card hand. So the fact that he gets the Mallow into the rare candy and the end. It's just going to be. That's going to be the plays. These are the kind of moves that Zachary would need to make. If he wants to take this to a game three. And you didn't see this in the previous game, but this is why people have been hyping Zoroark with Magnazone all weekend. Because it does stuff like this, using a Mallow to get the Magnazone, so that you can then end your opponent out of a big wheel GX. Most of the time you get that choice, you can either end them or you can get the guaranteed Magnazone. Zachary's actually getting both of those things in one here, and I said about the big wheel getting him a hand of 10 and how well it did last game. The crucial thing is, in game one, Zachary didn't have the end to follow up after the big wheel. In this game, it looks like he's going to have that. That is going to make a big, big difference. Maybe Brad ends up getting everything he needs from the end to six. It's not terrible. An end to six is fine. But an end to six, I mean, would you use your only GX attack of the game to get a new hand of six? You would if you're desperate. But it's not a statement attack like Big Wheel to 10 is. No, it's not quite the same play if you're making it. You know, you really won't do it unless you absolutely have to in those kind of situations. And here we go. Here's the propagation coming into play. Giving him free trades, free Ultra Balls. You know, he ended up putting the Zork and the Rare Candy on the top. He's got the top of Lily here, so this is what can, gra what can grab him the end if he wants. Get him a brand new hand of six, and... He still even has a trade left to use as soon as he draws a six, so it's effectively eight cards because he's got that execute in his discard as well. And I think that's a much better play. He knows his opponent is going to be playing uh, Parallel City. He knows he's going to be playing Skyfield, which at some point will be discarded. So he knows he's going to have a chance to discard those Tapu Lele off of his field, and it's not really going to hurt him having them on the bench. So getting the double Zoroark and then using the Tapu Lele for the end, I absolutely think that was the right sequencing there, because now he's still got the end, but he He's got two Tapu Lele out. Ooh. And what he really needs to do here is set himself up. He wants that Guzma double colorless energy because now he's got the setup. But he knows that if a Garboda comes down, all that good work is for naught. So now Zachary's real focus needs to be preparing so that if that Garboda comes down, it doesn't wreck his deck like it did in the previous game. Absolutely. And I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad thing that he has these four Via Seekers in hand um, just because of the <laughs> fact that he's playing Magnazone. You see he drew a Skyfield on a Zerua, so he gets to sit there, he gets to make choices, but unfortunately after opening up that Execute, that would be the last piece of the puzzle that would have been great, would have been seen like a Floatstone or something here so that he could actually go aggressive this turn. But at the same time, 
Kind of okay not doing so either because that Trample does have the energy ready to be able to Righteous Edge. So kind of like you mentioned earlier, you'd really almost just prefer to be using Riot of Speeding only if you're taking the knockout anyways. Yeah, I mean, if I'm Brad here, I want my... I want, uh, yeah, I want that. I want the Garboda. Because what I'm thinking for Zachary is, you versus Seeker for the Malo, grab yourself a Guzma and a double colorless energy, and then you're off again. And then, of course, you've got free versus Seeker in, in your hand, so you can keep using Guzma if that Garboda comes down. That is the play that I think is probably the best one to make, but you can only make that play if you've got the trade ability, if you've got the dual brains ability, and potentially if you've got the propagation ability. But having said that, an end comes down from Brad, so it's all a moot point now, because if Zachary's going to make that play, he's going to have to have access to a versus Seeker, so he can reuse that Mallow, otherwise he's not going to be able to search his deck like he would like to. And I do see first card off the top of the deck, though, for Brad was that Floatstone, so the Garbotoxin is going to come on live this turn. Um, assuming that he's going to be putting it there. And actually, I'm sorry, I think I was completely incorrect. Oh, no, it was his discard pile he was checking. Yes, he does still <laughs> have the Floatstone in there um, in his hand, so... It's easily done. There's lots to keep track of. So now Zachary doesn't have the Mallow option. What he needs now is a Guzma Double Colorless Energy. Yep. If he's got those two cards, he really doesn't care. I mean, all he does then is just bring up that Garboda, KO it with a Zoroark, take some prizes, get access all back, everything is good, life is good. If he doesn't have that, then all of a sudden we're looking at a repeat of the previous game. Good news, he's got a much better setup. Bad news, it doesn't mean anything if that Garbo Toxin's online. Bakery's deck is so reliant on supporter cards that he really, and it doesn't look like he has either piece right there. I don't think he's got the Guzma. I don't think he's got the double colorless. So he's going to put the Tapu Lele into the active, which I don't mind here, except if Brad is able to draw into his rainbow energy, he can then attach it to a bench Pokemon, damage it, and berserk for the KO, and it's essentially a free two prizes there. So that Tapu Lele in the active is a little risky, although he can hit for 100 here, so right. you see where he's going, I see why he made the play, I think it's a good play, and Brad's only playing one rainbow energy. Right. If he hits it, this could be a huge turn. Absolutely. But the good thing is it's only one. You know, he's going to be going down to five cards here from the, the end that's coming fresh off the top for Zach. Um, you know, using one of the VS Seekers that he pulled right back. Setting up the two-shot here on the Drampa. And this is those situations. This is the other thing that's also really good about going first against Drampa Garb is that knowing your opponent doesn't play things like Magma Base or anything like that, it means that if you don't attack and do, you know, a Pokemon and leave it damaged, it's not Trampa, they can't actually Berserk for 180, or excuse me, 150, 180 with a Choice Band until turn 3. It's the yeah. soonest that they can do it, and that is only assuming that they found their single re Rainbow Energy in Brad's case. It takes a lot longer. You've got to get the two energy attachments to Trampa, then get the double colorless. So I quite like this from Zachary. It's not the safest play ever, but he does oh! have a wall state. He top decks the only rainbow energy in his oh! deck. He literally top decks He's, it. He does still need the choice ban. I'm not sure if he has one in his hand. Oh, if but... he gets a choice ban, this is such oh, a great wow. top deck. I love that. I mean... Not, not for Zachary. It's horrible for Zachary, but just being able to get that... Oh, clearly Brad says, I'm probably not getting the choice band with this hand. I so, can't use... He can't use abilities. He didn't have a supporter in hand, so he said, you know what? I'm just going to have to go this route anyways. Then he just dumps the rainbow. So as crazy oh. it was to see that single rainbow energy there, not quite enough because he still needed the choice band. So it keeps Zachary still in the game in, t in that sense. I got excited about the choice band, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. You need the double. Uh, you need the choice band. If you don't have it, you're not getting the KO. What Brad has done is he's made the safe play. He's got the Dramper on the bench. He's attached the double colorless energy, and you've got to think this is the right play to make at this stage because you know what? He's setting up for the future. He's ahead by a prize. He's got the he's got the Garbo Toxin on board, and as fun as it would be to do the big, huge KO Atapu Lele play. You don't need to do it. You can even just Righteous Edge here, get rid of a double colorless energy, and then Zachary's under huge pressure just to find an energy to try and attack. And even if he does attack, then there could potentially be a, um, uh, excuse me, a Berserk next turn. I would expect to see a retreat here, because as it stands, if Zachary does find a double colorless, there's a KO coming. Yeah, here we go. So now he can this still Righteous like. Edge, but now he can only be hit back for 80. Oh, he had the choice band. Well, oh, he did have the choice band, yet he chose to not go for it. So, well, 
I still like this, though, because Brad just put himself... This is what I was talking about earlier when Brad knows how to plug Drampa, set up those berserks. He just set himself up here so he gets the right to righteous energy off, like he said, put... Stick up that Tapu Lele, set up the knockout for next turn on the Tapu Lele, making the safe play, but now Brad's about to have two different options that can use the Berserk for big damage, because he's going to have to hit the Dract of Drampa, and both of them are now going to be live. So he's really, he said, you know what, I know I can take this knockout here, I know I can go down to three prizes, but... I feel more comfortable and more secure in the long game. Maybe he's starting to figure out his opponent doesn't have that field blower. So he's saying, all right, let's go for this. Let's see if I could just set it up this way and make sure that my opponent has less outs for the future turns. Yeah, I don't need to rush. And the thing is, if he'd gone for the rainbow energy play, then that means that if Zachary draws into a double colorless, he knocks, he doesn't just get a KO, all the energy's gone off Brad's board. So I think Brad made the better play. I love the big splash plays. I love the aggressive plays. They make me happy because that's how I play the game. But the way Brad's going here, I think it is the better way to play. And I think you're right. If Zachary was, if Zachary had, say, played some field blows a previous game, if Brad was worried about big explosive turns, he might not do that. As it stands at the moment, it's not quite the same situation, and I think this is a good shout. He is prepared, and if we look at Zachary's board, I mean, okay, he's got two Zoroark that can't trade. He's got a Magnezone that can't use Jewel Brains, and he's got a Tapu Lele that doesn't have any energy. And has 50 damage now. I mean, at this point, Zachary's got to get a lot going for him. He really needs to have that Guzma on the Garbo Toxin, and what's... Interesting, though, about Brad's setup is that he's chosen to obviously leave this Trubbish here. He hasn't evolved it into a Trash Lance or anything because he knows at any point his Garble Toxin could come down. And the good thing is, is when the Garble Toxin gets knocked out, on for Brad at least, he still has another turn to get that Garble Toxin back into play. Zach doesn't get to use abilities immediately, so it gives him those kind of options to be able to stay fluid for the rest of the game. He does not want Zach to ever be able to have that Garble Toxin not be online when it comes to his turn. And see, now Brad's one turn later, and he's getting the big KO. He's going to Berserk. He's going to KO the Tapu Lele. He's going to go down to three prize remaining after playing an end. But the big difference here is he's now going to have a Rampa with, it looks like two double colorless, so yeah. four energy on. Okay, that's pretty susceptible to stuff like a Tapu Lele. But even in the worst case scenario, it goes down, and it wouldn't be a one-hit KO. I suppose it could with a huge Zoroark turn, but it's unlikely. He's still got a Zoroark on the bench with an energy. He's still got his Tauros. There are options there that maybe wouldn't have been if he'd taken the big KO the previous turn. And, and Zachary can get a KO here. It's just going to demand, you know, a, a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. And you do see, though, that he got the double colors off the top. So I think he's had a little bit of an issue finding this game. Um, this is only the second one he's really been able to find, but he does have also Skyfield to break out of the Parallel City Lock. He's got a Magnemite there. Can put a couple Pokemon on the bench, but like he said, it's a lot to take out this Drampa. Needs to be able to, if he doesn't have a Choice Band, needs to actually end up having the full bench. If he does end up getting the Choice Band, really only saves him one spot, so it's going to be a lot of Pokemon to get into play without even having access to trade or any of your abilities like dual brains he did actually have a bridget in hand which would be interesting except it would only put him to six six bench yeah. which would leave him one pokemon short even if he had a choice band so what he's doing he's playing a chorus he's getting himself eight which is it's a respectable chorus it's not a huge chorus it's not a chorus to 16 but it's a respectable chorus uh, One, I'm two. just looking for his... I don't think ah, I see a single Pokemon there's, there. There's only two and a choice band. He's, oh, he no, you're still right. Be a, he'd still be a couple short. Yeah, so, he'd only be doing 150 total, which would just not be enough. He, he did get a puzzle, so if he had just gotten that second puzzle with those two Pokemon and he has two basics in there, could have found ways of, you know, finagling and getting all the way to the seven Pokemon, but alas, it looks like he's probably going to end up being stuck on this. He's just going to have to ride his beating into the Drampa, set, settle for a two-hit knockout, but at the same time, that's really what Brad's doing also. The only difference is Brad's at three prizes and Zachary's at six. So he needs to be able to kind of take these bigger plays, take big knockouts to try to even the playing field. And that's what Zoroark does with Skyfield. Zoroark can take huge knockouts. Just not when you're ability locked and you have nothing going for you here. <laughs> and, and what we're probably going to see from Brad here is just another Righteous Edge. We're probably just going to see him playing Energy Denial because Zachary's not drawing much. You said yourself, he's only had two double colorless this turn. It's not going great for him. 
Brad, and we've seen this, Brad's playstyle this game has been very patient, very mm -hmm. methodical. He's not going for the big KOs. He is making the safe plays, which leave him in a position to win. And it's going beautifully for him here because it's just giving him that time to just sit there, get rid of the energy. He didn't win a super quick game one, but he won game one. He's not winning a super quick game two, but it looks like he's probably going to win game two. He's in a commanding position. And right now, You've got to be thinking, if Zachary had Field Blower in his deck, or if he had the Rosic, would it make a huge difference? Would he have drawn into it? Let's say he played one Field Blower. What are the odds he actually gets it in this game? If he's struggling to draw one of his four double colorless, is he really just going to draw into that one Field Blower? Brad's deck has been super consistent setting up here, and I think that has been the biggest factor in this game. Absolutely. Um, he may not be able to draw into it. It does give him the option to be able to pull it off of Mallow, so there's definitely, it's, it's really hard to be able to say what would really happen. You know, Akari, if you're him, you re he really wanted to hope that that end was going to stick, or you know that he's able to get an end and stick it at this point, So because that's really going to be one of his best bets, because Brad... Even though he's got energy on board, he's got Pokemon, really the only thing that can actually do significant damage right now is the top Lele on the bench if this Drampa gets knocked out. So if he's able to add him to three, Brad doesn't find any more energies and stuff, it could be a way to be able to kind of pull this back into his favor. It's definitely possible. But I think at this stage, it, it's probably best termed as a long shot. It's, I would agree with that, yes. It's just, and the thing is, Brad's got the big KO potential if a Tapu Lele comes down, which you've got to assume at this point is probably not. I mean, firstly, he's ability locked, and secondly, it can be KO'd with Berserk. But I don't think Brad's going to win this in the next turn or two. I think he's going to keep doing what he's doing. I like that he's got some energy on the Tapu Lele on the bench, gives him another option as an attacker to do a whole bunch of damage, which I like. But as it is, I mean, is he using Righteous Edge? I mean, you've got to think he's going to use Righteous Edge. Could be. I mean, at this point, you know, it's going to be the one, either which way, Zorg's got damage and everything on it, a couple different ways that he could actually pull this off. I mean, at this point, it's almost just, you know, the three price game. You're at three to six. You have half the amount of prize that your opponent has to take. Sure, Red does have damage on two of his Pokemon. Two of his, EXs, two of his GXs are in that one-shot range, whether or not Bakari's able to put on that, put down the Skyfield or not. So there's definitely different ways of being able to pull it off, but like I said, it is that long shot. Gets the Sears, not really going to do a whole... Well, it didn't really do a whole lot, because Brad's hand wasn't really much anyways. Brad's but, hand is not good. But, but at the same time, he's got Pokemon in play. Like I was saying earlier, your deck's basics, all you need at that point is energy. He's got Trash Lance on the board. He's got the top of Lady ready with a DC. He's got an Oracorio that can even attack. Really... It's all you really needed were those energies, so he's kind of fine. Point. Yeah, actually thinking about it, you're right. Brad's got the Pokemon. <laughs> all he needs is the energy, so I had the energy. It's actually like, cool. I didn't really need a choice band. Yeah, I've got choice band on most of my Pokemon. Wouldn't mind it on the uh, bench drum, but it's not the end of the world. So yeah, you know what? I've got my energy. That's okay by me. Now, the good news is, Zachary's got some damage on that Drampa, but it's just a, a parallel city. Oh, is he able to take the KO there? Yes, that yes. was a KO and everything. It was actually exact damage to be able to take that knockout because it was a damage from the previous turn. There we go. Um, yes, it was now, 16, just did 110. Now, what's going to be interesting is, so does he have enough Pokemon in the discard pile? He does. So he can actually use Oracorio to Supernatural Dance, finish off this Zorak, and actually set up the next one for the knockout as well. Not enough Pokemon to be able to knock out the Magnemite and the Zorak in this turn and take the win right now, but he does at least be able to set it up for the following turns. Yeah, that's big. When I said 60 and 110, it wasn't. It was more than 60 and 110. I just wanted people to know I could still do maths. I still count. <laughs> but you're right. The Oracle is not going to win him the game this turn. But even looking at the field, you know, it's what we've been saying all game. Okay, fine. He took a KO. But how much does it really matter? Tapu Lele is going to come in to 110. There's at least 100 damage on the Zoroark. So that goes down now. Mm -hmm. So now Brad's down to one prize, and he's got the Tapu Lele with a two energy and a choice band. He's got the Drampa, and now he probably could just stick, unless Zachary somehow gets Rare Candy Magnezone, next turn Brad can probably just pop an energy on that Oracorio, right. come up, Supernatural Dance, KO the Magnemite, and that'll just be the game. No, and we know he has it from that gets us. You know he's still sitting <laughs> on the Psychic Energy, so it's literally, Zach has to get Rare Candy Magnezone, 
or find a way to bump his own Magnemite off the field, which, being that he doesn't have the Sky Field of his own in play, I don't think there's any possible way he could pull that off. So he he has to get out Rare Candy Magnezone this turn, or knock out the Oracorio, or he just loses the game the following turn to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's such a rough way at the moment, but th th this is what it is. This is what the game comes down to. Brad, and I love that we've seen in this game how beautifully... This Drampa deck, and it really is a Drampa deck. Drampa has been doing the heavy lifting in this deck. Oh, yeah. It's so lovely how it's been working, because even though it can get big KOs on stuff like Tapu Lele, it's been rocking along, it's been doing its thing, it's been a slow, methodical, nicely paced game, and it's just been doing its thing, and that's what's so beautiful about it. So we do see Zachary here presumably going for the end to one, I mean, he played the Versus Seeker and both players are shuffling. I'm going to assume it's an end to one. Maybe Brad doesn't get the energy. But even if he doesn't get the energy for Oricorio, he's still going to be able to put damage on the board. He's still mm -hmm. going to be able to hit with Tapu Lele, or he's going to be able to hit with a Drampa, or even he's going to be able to hit with the Garboda. Either way, this is looking good. And I think the green, the big green die there, I think is six damage counters. Oh, sorry, six, six items. items in Zachary's discard pile, because it went up to six when he played the Versus Seeker. Right. So even doing 120 or 100, I mean, if there's a Guzma, Brad wins the game. If there's an Energy, Brad wins the game. If there's neither, he'll probably win in a couple of turns anyway. Right. He's got several different outs that he can actually pull. Um, if Zach was able to somehow pull off a oh, knockout on this. Oh, that's it. The VS Seeker. I'm assuming the Guzma's in the there discard pile. Guzma. That's it's, it. May, maybe it's a Zoro one. Maybe it's a Magnemite. We don't know. We do know it's a KO. And Brad will take this 2-0 and go to 6-0. and Not guaranteed top 32 yet, but he needs one win out of three. Given 86-0, I like his chances. 